policies is essential if we would like to keep the Paris Agreement goals within reach. So here on this slide, what you're seeing is what the arc of ambition should look like all the way to 2050, uh, what it was supposed to look like this year, even though, um, of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has understandably sort of thrown spanners in the works in terms of countries announcing their enhanced climate plans because government attention has uh, been monopolized and rightly so uh, by mitigating the urgent health crisis. Um, so on the side, what you can see is that countries can enhance their NDCs in a range of different ways that align with their internal developmental um, priorities. So first, I'd like to clarify what we mean when we say NDC enhancement so that we're all on the same page. Because as you know, NDCs are very diverse and they cover a wide range of issues and sectors. So when WRI, uh, my institute, when we first started work on, uh, working on this, we broke down um, all the different ways in which it might be possible to enhance NDCs. And we came up with these four different categories. We have enhancing mitigation ambition, which means that under the enhanced NDC, if it's fully implemented, the overall cumulative greenhouse gas emissions would be lower than they would have been under the fully implemented initial NDCs. Um, we have a separate category on implementation where countries um, include elements in their NDCs that make it easier to achieve the level of ambition that they already had in their initial NDC. Then we have adaptation, uh, which the vast majority of countries have included in their NDCs, especially developing countries. Um, and that's also an area where enhancement can happen. And finally, we have what we call communication of clarity, transparency, and understanding, where countries can provide clarifications, for example, about the scope of a greenhouse gas target, uh, what is the baseline year, the reference year, et cetera. Um, actually, WRI and UNDP, together with other partners, have come up with a series of guidance documents on enhancing NDCs. We have an overarching guidance document, uh, which we launched in September during Climate Week. And then at COP25, we launched several sector-specific guidance documents on opportunities to enhance NDCs in four sectors, which are power, power transport, agriculture, and forestry. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we also have um, a tracker, which you can see on the slide. It's a tracker that tracks countries that have committed to enhancing their NDCs. Uh, this year, countries that have committed to updating their NDCs this year, and then those that you can see in gray um, are those countries that have not signaled any intent regarding their NDCs, and it also shows those countries that have already submitted their NDC in 2020. So let's take a look at who's on the map. Um, we have 33 countries, including all the countries within the EU, who have committed to update their NDCs. We have 105 countries who have committed to enhancing their NDCs by 2020, and we already have 10 countries that have submitted their 2020 um, NDC. And so taking a closer look, what's interesting is that the enhances, so the 105 countries that have promised that they would enhance their NDC this year, represent 15% of global emissions, which is a good start, and that's great. And the countries that have said that they would enhance climate ambition uh, should be, you know, felicitated and commended for that. But it's not good enough because it's only 15% of global emissions. And so, of course, we need the big emitters to join the club. Um, so those who've said that they would enhance their NDCs are mostly small and medium-sized economies. We have almost all of the African continent, so 45 African countries, really showing leadership here. We have all of the, almost all of the small island developing, developing states, uh, that's 37 of them. And there is a, a little bit of overlap with the African countries. Uh, Latin America shows quite some leadership with Costa Rica, Argentina, Colombia, per Peru, Ecuador, Mexico. Um, they've all committed to enhance. And on the east, we have Nepal, pa Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, who've also said that they would enhance climate ambition. And so very notably, uh, you can see that those who are missing on this map are the big emitters. So there's no signal from China, India, Brazil, US, obviously, they have not uh, said that they would enhance their climate ambition this year. Um, if we look a little more closely at who has already submitted their NDCs, that's 10 countries. They represent 2.9, so almost 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 
the Marshall Islands was the first mover and they submitted their new NDC way back in 2018. They were followed in December 2019 by Suriname and both of these countries represent a tiny, tiny share of global emissions. So in submitting their enhanced climate plans, they're sort of making a statement that small and vulnerable countries that are already facing impacts of climate change are fully committed to doing their full share and their fair share in reducing emissions. Then in February, we had Norway uh, that took an important step um, and showed some leadership as the first develop developed country to announce a strengthened NDC. Um, in March 2020, the Republic of Moldova, which is, as you know, a small Central European country, they submitted a new climate plan. Um, Moldova represents less than 1% of global emissions and set a target to reduce its emissions of 70% below 1990 levels by 2030, which is pretty ambitious uh, for a small country. And I'm not going to go into all of them, but we also have Singapore, Chile, Rwanda, Andorra, Japan, New Zealand. Uh, they've all submitted their new NDCs, so I'm not going to provide detail on all of them, but I do want to highlight Chile and Rwanda, who recently, just like last month and last week, released uh, their enhanced climate plans uh, with significant progress beyond what they had submitted in 2015. And this is a really important example of uh, that countries, that other countries should emulate, especially because Chile and Rwanda submitted their new climate plans in the middle of the health crisis. And so they're really showing and they're leading by example that uh, COVID-19 recovery responses and NDCs will provide a win-win situation if the processes are coordinated um, and that really they can go hand in hand. And then a last word on Japan and New Zealand, who unfortunately, they sneaked in NDCs that were unchanged from the NDCs they submitted five years ago. And so that's really the fear. The fear is that countries use this exceptional situation, the pandemic, as an excuse to submit unambitious NDCs uh, under the pretext that climate action and sustainable development are luxuries that we cannot afford right now, when in fact, we know that nothing could be further from the truth. And there are plenty of studies that show that enhanced climate action, as we know, leads to better, healthier, and more prosperous economic growth. I'll just say one word on the EU. Um, the EU uh, has committed, has said that it would update its NDC this year. Um, as a response, as you know, COP26, so the UN uh, conference that happens on an annual basis uh, to discuss climate action between countries, COP26 uh, has been postponed to COP21, but as a response, to, sorry, has been postponed to 2021. Uh, but as a response to this, the EU Commission has confirmed that it will not slow down its work to prepare for an ambitious uh, COP26 and to prepare for an enhanced NDCs. Um, so there is hope that the Commission will stick to its time schedule and will submit an NDC before the end of the year. Um, right now, the pandemic is leading the EU to sort of reevaluate its whole work plan for 2020. And it's a little too early to tell how the EU is going to emerge from COVID-19. But we have seen that the pandemic has sort of brought a new high level reaffirmation of the climate agenda by several EU leaders, but also by broad, a broad range of stakeholders within the EU and also an unprecedented acknowledgement of the role of science in decision-making and the role of science in responding to a crisis. Um, so like I said, right now the EU is reviewing its work plan for 2020 and actually they're due to put forward tomorrow a revised work plan and a revised uh, multi-annual financial framework that will be a very strong investment signal. Um, and, and that's when we're gonna see if uh, the money is actually act, where the money actually goes. Uh, does it back up um, those encouraging narratives that we've heard from the EU um, or, or does it not? So we have to keep, a, keep an eye open for what happens tomorrow. So I'm gonna pause here for a second. Um, I have a question for participants. I'm not sure how they go ahead and respond, but the question is, has your country's government started the process of revising its NDC by COP26? Yes, no, or or if you don't know. Uh, thank you for bringing this question, Naomi. So dear participants, if you could please now vote in the chat and put one, if your country has started the process of revising its NDC, 
Two, if no, it still has not. And three, if you don't know about it. Please start voting and start writing the figure in the chat so that we can get an overview of your countries present. Oh yeah, and someone can also draw on the on the slide. That's 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 another good idea. So either in the slide or in the chat. Yeah. So as we can see, quite a few countries have started the process of revising. And uh, yeah, we have more yes than no at the moment. And interestingly, we don't have any don't knows. So it shows the level of expert knowledge among our participants, which is, is great. Yeah, that's great. Okay, as the voting goes on, I suggest, Naomi, that you go on with your, with your presentation. Sure, should I switch the slide? Uh, yes, please, but we still can, we can continue voting in the chat. All right, great. Thanks. Um, so really, why should countries enhance their NDCs? Um, it's true that the pandemic is sort of turning everything on its head as we know it. Um, and so let's think about has climate change action and ambition taken a backseat in terms of relevance or not? Um, well, firstly, let's take a look at why it was important in the first place to enhance climate ambition. Uh, Firstly, because we know from the science that we're not on track to reach the Paris goals. And we know that large scale immediate transformation is needed to achieve the Paris goals. So that's why we have to enhance our climate ambition if we want to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. But also why should we enhance our climate ambition now? It's because since the 2014, 2015 timeframe, when countries were developing their first NDCs, there has been tremendous change. There's, there have been tremendous advances, particularly in terms of technology, in terms of cost reduction in many sectors, but also in terms of new policies, in terms of best practices that we know of, and many more solutions are available today. Since the first NDCs were developed in 2015, um, we have new opportunities for climate action that seemed actually improbable even just five years ago. Uh, for example, Renewable energy are much cheaper and more accessible than any, ever before. Um, and there's also a growing recognition that uh, climate action is not a burden to the economy, but there are serious economic opportunities that can be uh, take that, that can happen from climate action. And therefore, it is possible and it's actually desirable to be enhancing climate action. Um, now, of course, like I previously said, COVID-19 has diverted countries' attention to the urgent task of managing the health crisis. Um, but the fact is that the pandemic is actually only a painful reality check of what awaits us if we don't take climate action now, because unfortunately the climate emergency has not been put on hold for the pandemic. And in fact, the climate emergency just continues to unroll in a linear fashion. So governments are already considering major economic stimulus plans to save our economies. And the choices that they will make today will bear huge implications for the common future of all of us. And therefore governments have a really, they really have a responsibility to choose wisely today. Um, so I don't want us to mix everything up. We must acknowledge that NDCs and COVID-19 recovery plans are not the same thing. They're conceptualized for different purposes and different objectives. The core objective of NDCs is to address climate change and the core objective of COVID-19 recovery package is social and economic recovery. But there are elements in both that are common. Um, and those common elements are, I would say, the centrality of building resilient and sustainable socioeconomic systems without which neither the NDCs or the COVID recovery packages can stand on their two feet. And so as such, it's useful to think of NDCs and recovery measures as different tools in the policymakers toolbox that can contribute towards the same goals, for example, uh, reducing poverty, but also bet more prosperity, uh, social and planetary well-being and improved public health. Um, and policymakers may like to think of the coordination between both processes as building blocks. So you have the recovery measures on one side that, that need to have immediate impact, you know, immediate benefits such as job creation 
or uh, reactivation of supply chains or better energy security, more food security. And then you have the NDCs and what underpins the NDCs builds out areas in a longer time frame, like deploying industrial transformation, for example. And so the time frames are different, uh, but crucially the time frames are overlapping and that's why they're complementary because our ability to achieve the NDCs in 2030 depends fundamentally on what we do right now. And that has all to do with how we recover. Um, and in fact, it's possible to look at elements of the NDCs, for example, policies, measures, or targets that can be converted into actionable stimulus interventions. Um, so on this slide, what I'm trying to show you is that um, it's sectoral policies and measures that will be the bridge between the recovery measures for COVID and the NDCs, because in the, in the sectoral policies and measures, you have pract practical sectoral action that can provide the immediate benefits pursued in terms of job creation, supply chains, et cetera, but they also have co-benefits that can be built on to enhance climate ambition. Um, and so I mentioned before, WRI published a series of guidance reports at COP25 on opportunities to enhance NDCs in different sectors. And we provide in these guidances key recommendations for countries to identify sectoral opportunities that could strengthen their NDC. And so a useful exercise in the new context is to go back to those recommendations and examine which ones equate to spending that easily and quickly delivers the largest employment and multiplier effects with economic and social and health co-benefits. So in this table, you can see a similar exercise and I'll take just one example from the power sector. For example, in the power sector, the stimulus spending could be directed to, for example, boosting renewable energy production or to boosting local production of renewable energy equipment or to building smart energy infrastructure. Because in fact, many studies find that clean energy infrastructure construction creates twice as many jobs per dollar as fossil fuel investments. So that could be, you know, the recovery package. And how would that translate into the NDC? Well, it could be, for example, an installed capacity um, target, uh, sorry, an installed capacity for renewable energy target. It could be energy access targets, or it could be solar rooftop targets. Um, and in fact, in addition to Chile and Rwanda who submitted their NDCs, we have two other countries who are leading the way through the pandemic and who are showing that COVID recovery and fighting climate change are complementary. Um, I'll start with Spain. Uh, just last week, Spain unveiled a draft climate law to cut emissions to net zero by 2050, and it's explicit about the fact that this climate law sets the direction of economic recovery from the pandemic. Um, and examples of measures within the law that the Spanish government is pledging to take are, for example, to make Spain's electricity system 100% renewable by uh, mid-century, or to stop all new coal, oil, and gas extraction projects immediately, or to end direct fossil fuel subsidies, for example. And what's really wonderful is that the government forecasts that this climate plan would generate more than 200,000 million euros of investment in the next decade, and also create, create up to 350,000 new jobs every year. And then the second country that's also leading the way um, is South Korea. They're on track to set um, a 2050 carbon neutral goal after their Democratic Party won an absolute majority in the country's election last month. And under this plan, South Korea has become the first country in East Asia to pledge to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And the plan includes large scale investments in renewable energy. It also includes a carbon tax, um, the phase out of domestic and overseas coal financing, which is really important for South Korea. Um, and it also plans, uh, it has plans to support transitions for workers towards green jobs. So it's really wonderful to see those countries coming up with those stimulus packages in the middle of the pandemic that have such a green component to them. Um, and so that's my last slide. Um, I'd just like to quickly go through why it's important, why the NDCs are still important in the new context and why is it not enough to just have clean recovery packages? Um, well, firstly, um, like I said before, the stimulus spending is immediate and the NDCs have a longer time frame spanning over a decade. And that's why the NDCs are important because they send signals and they have to send the right signals for the investments to go the right way. 
Um, and it could also be an opportunity to unlock international finance for the same goals. And it's really important to have that decade signal, which provides more clarity, more certainty, because badly designed, there's a real risk that the stimulus measures could lock us into decades of polluting activity, and that would be fatal. Um, it's important that we don't only focus on the short term. As important as it is, we shouldn't only focus on the short term, and we also need medium long-term planning to ensure that um, this is not locking us into a future that has greater risk and greater vulnerability locked into it. But also there's a huge value presented by the NDC process because it's subjected to international accountability and therefore it would help prevent greenwashed recovery plans. Um, the NDCs provide an accountability structure to help keep things on track post the initial uh, stimulus investment. And finally, uh, well, COVID-19 has underscored the need for multilateralism and for international cooperation. And both of those had sort of taken a hit in the year since Paris. So treating the NDCs with all the seriousness that they deserve can not only complement and strengthen recovery efforts, but they can also inject the much needed bolstering of the um, international process. Um, so thank you so much. Um, here you can see the link where you can access the resources that I mentioned earlier, the guidance report on how to step up uh, climate ambition on the WRI website. Um, thanks for having me and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi. That was really a very comprehensive overview of the global situation and global efforts in raising up MDCs and trying to fight multiple crises at the same time. Uh, so we have our first question to you from participants. And the question is, we keep talking about NDC, but isn't it an outdated instrument? Europe takes up very ambitious climate goals, but Europe and European Union also consumes products which are produced elsewhere in countries like China, India, and Russia, which have very high carbon footprint. So can we, uh, do we really consider an extra counting of greenhouse gases, uh, not based on uh, production, but based on consumption? Thank you, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, um, on whether or not the NDC is an outdated instrument, um, I, I think, you know, the Paris Agreement, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, once the immediate health crisis is dealt with in the second wave or in the third wave, once the, once the health emergency is over, um, I think that really the SDGs, the, sorry, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement should really be the North Star because what the pandemic has shown is um, a real need for collective action and international cooperation. That's the only way that a global problem can be solved through global action. Um, and, and therefore the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, they are what we have that is international and that is shared. Um, and so I think that going forward, um, it's not about whether it's outdated. I think it's about co coordinating the different processes to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction um, and using the different tools that we have in our toolbox to make that happen. Um, and therefore it's not, you know, NDCs versus recovery packages, it's really building blocks, how they build off each other. And what I tried to show in my, in my presentation is how, yes, you know, it's important to have stimulus spending, but it's important that it's clean, that it's resilient, that it's green. And therefore the NDC for that provides us with you know, the North Star, like I said, like the vision to make sure that those investments are directed the right way. Um, and so it's making sure that there's a policy narrative. I mean, you were asking about the EU. Um, it, it's not just about what's on the NDC on paper, but it's making sure that everything is coming together. So in the case of the EU, it would be making sure that there's the recovery package, the NDC, but also uh, the EU Green Deal, that all of it sort of comes together um, and, and makes sense. And then in terms of uh, consumption versus production, I mean, uh, emissions. Yes, of course, it's, it's extremely uh, important. I think uh, what 
to, it's this differentiation is is very important. I think the EU is. I mean, we're, we're going to have to wait and see what comes out of the work package tomorrow if the, if they do release it tomorrow, um, and where the budget actually goes. Um, but prior to the pandemic, the EU was was uh, actually beginning to um, look at uh, tax borders uh, to make sure that uh, everything that it would import actually had lower carbon footprints. And so I think that was already a first step in the direction of trying to make sure that, you know, it's not just about the emissions that are produced in Europe, but it's also about the emissions that are consumed outside. Uh, thank you for this answer. Um, another question, what kind of approaches do we have at the moment in uh, uh, trying to estimate um, direct and indirect um, emissions and responsibility for indirect emissions? By indirect, I believe uh, the expert asking these questions means brings up an example of a car uh like if you buy a car and i use it who is responsible for that the one the company who built the car and who extracted oil right yeah. yeah well i think maybe what the participants referring to is the trading mechanisms that we have to trade emissions um and to make sure that there's no double counting so to make sure that you know if if um in the if if one if country a is uh reducing its emissions that it's but country b is funding them for example country b is providing the money to reduce the emissions like who in their ndc who counts who who accounts for the emission reduction is it the country that has funded part of the emission reduction or is it the country where the emission reductions have actually happened um so it's very complex and um, it's actually one part, the Paris Agreement is an agreement, and then there's a lot of different work streams within the agreement um, that countries are still negotiating the rules um, to, to, to implement and to operationalize the agreement. And under the Paris Agreement, there's what we call Article 6. That's the article that deals with exactly that, um, with, with how country, with the rules to make sure that how countries trade their emissions is transparent um, and has environmental integrity and therefore avoids double counting. And what happened at the last two climate negotiations, so COP24 and COP25, is that countries were not able to actually uh, come to an agreement for these on these rules. They had a draft text uh, during COP25 that unfortunately had a lot of loopholes and that did not safeguard the environmental integrity of the Paris Agreement and that allowed maybe for this double counting. So what happened is that the draft was not accepted um, and they pushed the negotiations back to COP26, which was supposed to happen this November, but that's going to now happen in 2021. Um, and I think that, you know, no agreement on Article 6 and on the mechanisms for trading missions, no agreement is better than a bad agreement, because if you have a bad agreement, you have this opportunity for double counting, which which goes against climate ambition um, and which can put the world on a dangerous climate trajectory. And so I, I hope that um, at the next COP26, whenever that happens, uh, countries are able to come up with an agreement on how to trade emissions and international trading mechanisms, because it is it's really part of the architect of the international architecture to reduce emissions. And even though no agreement is better than a bad agreement, we do need an agreement because we really need to settle those rules to put boundaries around how countries can do this. Uh, thank you for this. We have a few other questions, but since we don't have much time left, I would just take one of them. And then if you don't mind, maybe we'll pass on your email address to participants so that they can ask for the questions if they have it later on. Sure. Um, so the question is, um, if we look up at the pandemic now, and uh, do you think pandemic brings, will bring in more localization, like localization of production, and thus less international tra trade and less international uh, logistics, like moving goods and resources from place to place? Uh, would that be a good consequence, a good environmental and climate consequence of the pandemic? Uh, so what do you think about that and what do you think about 
more localization as a better way of dealing with climate crisis? Well, um, yeah, that's also a good question. I, um, I, I, you know, countries are going to look at trying to reactivate supply chains. Um, they're also going to look at protecting their economies. I mean, that's not at least salvaging their economies, and that's normal. And if it means more local production, um, why not? You know. Uh, but what I'd like to say is that more local production doesn't necess doesn't mean no the end of multilateralism and the end of international cooperation. Uh, it doesn't mean protectionism and it doesn't mean you know populism or nationalism. Uh, I think that we can we can have more local supply chains and at the same time have a coordinated response to the pandemic, just like we can have a coordinated response to climate change. Um, and, and in that sense, you know, it's, it's countries adopting a coordinated response to one problem and that's how they'll solve it. And if part of the response is local, more locally produced um, things or vegetables or whatever it is, uh, that's fine as long as, you know, there's a coordinated response that can promote multilateralism. But if every country is sort of taking its own, uh, you know, having its own way of handling the pandemic, without concerning other countries and without, um, you know, uh, coordinating, I think that can be damaging. And locally produced uh, supply chains, uh, you know, there can also be, for example, coordinated spending on research and development for finding a vaccine. It doesn't exclude um, other areas where uh, spending can be sort of put together towards the same, um, the same goal uh, without necessarily retracting into protectionism and into uh, the death of multilateralism, which I think is is really important in a global problem, you know, viruses and greenhouse gas emissions, they don't understand borders, and therefore um, it's only a global concerted coordinated effort that's going to put us on track to solve it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, well, we have so many questions coming up. Maybe I'll just take one of them before we finish. And uh, so because that question concerns our region. And uh, this is the following question. Thanks for the great overview. Are there gu guidelines by the WRI also regarding the process of NDC enhancement? Which stakeholders to involve, etc.? And are there specific guidelines for regions? It would be great to have a paper specifically on Eastern Europe. Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. So uh, like I said, we have an overarching guidance that takes governments or whoever wants to read the guidance uh, on a step-by-step -step approach on how to identify where are the opportunities within their NDC to enhance climate ambition. And then we didn't do it regionally, we did it sectorally. So we produced the same, we, building on the overarching guidance, we produced sectoral guidance that governments can take, policymakers can look at and follow this similar step-by-step -step approach um, to identify where, where are the opportunities in their sector. So we have power, we have transport, agriculture, forestry, and also short-lived climate pollutants. Um, and, and identify where are the opportunities to build, to build on and to enhance ambition. So we understand that um, you know, there's no one silver bullet, there's no one size fits all. And so the, the guidance reports are really made in that way that we're not you know, saying every country must do this, but we're offering a step-by-step -step approach so that countries can undertake national assessments and draw their own conclusions. So hopefully in those reports, every policymaker or even other stakeholders uh, can read them and can use the method that we, um, that we propose and apply it to their national circumstances in order to figure out how best uh, their NDC could be uh, enhanced. Uh, and I'll just finish by saying, we are, however, trying to take this guidance to the countries. So, um, you know, countries that show interest, we're, we're doing webinars or stakeholder workshops to unpack those uh, sectoral guidances and to see really what, if we use our sectoral method in this country or in that country, you know, what does it mean uh, and how, how can we apply it to the country's circumstances to figure out what would be the best way forward for that country in terms of enhancing its NDC in, in power sector or in transport sector. 
And we very much value the engagement of stakeholders. In fact, we think that the process of revising the NDC has to be a multi-stakeholder process because if all the stakeholders involved in the transitions are involved, um, then it generates much more engagement, it generates much more buy-in, and therefore it's not you know, arbitrarily decided targets, but it's targets that have been decided with everyone who's gonna be impacted by the transition, and therefore it facilitates implementation greatly. So I don't know which, who, who asked this question, but if they'd like to get in touch with me and uh, we could work on uh, you know, bringing, having a webinar or bringing this, a few of these guidance reports to the country in question, uh, we'd be delighted to do that. Yeah, I also believe from my side that it will be highly useful, like globally and also for the region. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi. We still have a few questions and comments, but unfortunately we have to cut now because we have the program.